Welcome to this week's Caddy Wampus Podcast. I'm Kirk Driscoll, your host. We got my friend Mark with me today. We're going to mix some things up, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I'm uh, looking forward to it. I'm okay. counting on yeah, it. Yeah, you're counting on it. Um, and so I've got a cough drop in my mouth, and I'm trying not to cough this morning, so hopefully everybody won't see it popping around in uh, my mouth here uh, this morning. But uh, we'll do it. Yeah. So thanks for coming by. Thanks for being willing to be here. It's good to be here. And I love, love, love your podcast and your guests and what you do and why you do it. I would ask you a question about it, but then I don't want to catch you off guard where he's telling us a fib because we may have a, you know, but on a serious note, we've had some incredible guests. Yes, you have. Um, I really, I was really proud of my sister last week. My uh, sister was on and uh, it's pretty cool to share that, to share that time with her. So. It's and that's a, not easy in, between family members to no, share all No, it's, it's not. And um, But she picked on me. I picked on her. And yeah. I apologize for whatever trauma I created in her life is uh, terrorizing her as an older brother. So, But um, I appreciate you being here. And I'm really glad. I think Rena, did Rena connect us up or who? who a number of connections. Rena being definitely one of them. She is fantastic. But most recently, it was Rena. Rena. Yes. And then you live around this, you know, in the Alpharetta area. Right. Actively involved with, uh, for 13 years, I was in the North Point Community Church uh, production team, involved in a lot of different groups, very yeah. active in the community. So how would you describe what you do day to day, day to day for folks? Yeah, that, that's uh, about uh, a little less than a year ago, I dropped out of the corporate world to spend full time into the, what I affectionately like to call the business of forgiveness. Yeah. So I do uh, forgiveness coaching, yeah. uh, speaking, uh, author, and it's part ministry, uh, part counseling, and it's a combination between clinical psychology, theology, and experience to help people who are carrying around what I like to call a backpack of pain, shame, blame, anger, resentment. You know, do you know what happened to me? Yeah. Do, do you know how my brother terrorized me when I was, oh, oh, oh I won't tell you what I <laughs> yeah, did. Did my sister call you this week? If not, <laughs> she, if not, she might be calling you next oh, week. Yeah, I'm this. expecting the phone call. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, that's good. You know, um, in the recovery world with a lot of guys that I work mm -hmm. with, guilt, shame, remorse, that baggage and that weight that we carry around. Some don't even know they're carrying it. Absolutely. Others know they're carrying it, but don't know how to get rid of it. Um, are unwilling and, and they're willing at times, some are unwilling, but, but there's a lot of folks and that's what I hope you've got an incredible story that we're going to share today. And I think there's a lot of folks that will watch this and, and, and be inspired and gain hope and way. Okay. There is a way to move through this and that's to correct. forgive. That's why I like to share my story, be completely transparent for, yeah. for most of my life. I wore a mask and was not, would not share it all. And in the recovery world, you have really, there are four types of uh, hurts of forgiveness. And in the recovery world, it, it almost covers all four of them in a lot of cases. And that being somebody hurt you, they yeah. did something really bad to you. You hurt somebody else, will you forgive me? Forgiving yourself. And then the one that of omission of neglect. And mm -hmm. as you know, often in those cases, they go through all four, not realizing that the pain it's causing not only them, but the relationships of the people around them. Yeah, it's like the when we're when we're bound by anything, mm -hmm. whether it's pain, shame, guilt, fear, anxiety, whatever it might be. Yes, it's affecting us, but it's affecting those around us as well, negatively or positively. Yeah, right? if you think about it, is somebody hurts you, right, and it caused wound. Somebody ripped your arm open. There would be a pretty bad wound, and that's it's painful. But if you don't heal it. Then all of a sudden you get infection. And just as it is in forgiveness, the longer you leave it open, don't do anything about it. The wound of unforgiveness can affect and infect uh, everything in your body, all your relationships mm. and your world around you and not realizing of the damage that it's causing, causing later on down the road. Yeah, no, that's a great, great way to look at it. Well, let's um, kind of jump into that caddy. I think it's, that cattywampus moment of your life, um, I know it was a series of over a period of time, but what, how would you book? I don't even know how to work because I know we had coffee and we talked through it. So how would you like to share that moment of your life? 
Sure. I, I almost feel as though my middle name is Ketty Wampus, right? Yeah. Um, I grew up in the town of Ketty Wampus, the house of Ketty Wampus, <laughs> yeah. right? Good portion of my life, I didn't know anything but Ketty Wampus. And so to tie that in is to my story. As a teenager, I lived homeless in the streets of LA in the beaches, uh, literally eating out of dumpsters and soup lines. By the way, there is an art to eating out of dumpsters. Uh, you don't eat off the top, off the sides, yeah. right in the middle there. There's almost like a cooler. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. There's just center. Yeah, in case I have any of your listeners are struggling <laughs> on how to do it right. Um, but as strange as that sounds, it was uh, that year and living in the streets was, it was better. It was a step up. Uh, it was safer than what I had growing up in Detroit. Now, Detroit itself is, you know, it's not exactly the most desirable so, city. Yeah. I get it. But it was inside of the house of a family that were mom, dad, they were alcoholic. But a father who is um, abusive, when I say abusive, physically abusive, with my three oldest brothers, I was the youngest, he used to beat them to their virtually unconscious. Uh, my oldest brother threw him out the front picture window. Mm. But it didn't stop there. My dad sexually abused his own boys. So for a little boy to be sexually abused is one thing by your own father. You can imagine it can cause him. I, could, deep I, blues. Could, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. And my brothers didn't fare so well. My oldest brother passed away a few years ago, just full of anger. Do you know what happened to me? He, he would not let go of that backpack. There's mm. no way. And my next oldest brother is schizophrenic, lives in a special home in Florida and have taken care of my whole life. He's with his imaginary friends. It's safer for him to escape and put those walls around him. And then my middle brother, the one who led me to the Lord and uh, taught me business as one of my best friends, called me while on the phone call, took his own life. With you on the phone? Yes. And here I am, one of the happiest guys you'll ever meet. I've got a beautiful life. i got a beautiful wife, six gorgeous girls, 13 grandkids. How does that make sense? Yeah. So if you take it back to your childhood, mm -hmm. If we had to kind of set the stage. You're the youngest of the, so you had three older brothers. That's great. And you never had a home environment that was stable. You, you from. That's a, I grew up Caddy Wappas. You, so when you're looking at your normal, was that, what was normal? What did that feel like as a child growing up in that? It's great. I, um, good portion there was neglect. The example I'd like to give is I know my mother at some point did my laundry. I didn't come out of the womb doing it, but I have no memory of it. Uh, I was basically on my own. I skipped school. Nobody would say anything. Um, but it was a uh, just a con constant environment until I had the opportunity as um, a sophomore and junior in high school to get away. Uh, so people pitched in and was able to get me out of there into a a boarding school, a Christian boarding school in Asheville, North Carolina. And all of a sudden, I'm around a totally different environment. There was P, uh, preacher kids, missionary kids, ordinary kids, PKs, MKs, and OKs. And for the first time in my life, I was OK. Yeah. And it opened up my eyes that there's a different world, and it changed, and it rocked my world. Yeah. I mean, that would have to be a whole ex experience within itself, just the freedom that was found. And that, and that change. It was fantastic. It was, it was really good. But the real turning point was um, later, later in life, uh, later in uh, early 20s, um, I got out of Detroit and didn't know a soul. I just, I'm a dead man walking there, yeah. packed up everything I own and headed to Tampa, Florida. And I joined a, um, a business conference by Brian Tracy, The Psychology of Achievement. If you ever get a chance, it fantastic. However many years, it's still applicable today as he did back then. Yeah. And he said, if it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, it's up to me. And I started thinking about it is I have a choice. Uh, I can keep carrying around that wound and anger and resentment, or I can forgive my dad and do something about this and move forward. Yeah. So how did that look? So to forgive someone that physically and sexually abused you that is your father and on top of it your father right what how did you navigate through that what tools or what did that process look like is there yeah i had the the easiest of the boys so um 
uh, I wasn't sexually abused by my dad like my three older brothers were. However, in going from uh, L.A. to Detroit hitchhiking back when there were no cell phones, uh, I got it picked up by a couple of cowboys that were trying to help me out. And I, I uh, experienced that nightmare in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Hmm. And so um, my forgiveness was more than just for my dad. It's um, to a degree blame my dad for even putting me in that position that I would be hitchhiking uh, in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Yeah. So um, the process was uh, it, just that, that wound, open that up, and that I want to have a better life. So I set off on uh, business-wise to learn a field called computer telephony. And without a college degree, by age 40, I was the CTO of a publicly traded telecom company. I'm going to be emotionally healed. I am going to have a great family. And I set out to say, I have a choice. Blame looks to the past. I can, like my brothers, I can keep blaming. Mm -hmm. Or responsible looks for the future. And I decided to look for the future. But a big part of that was that forgiveness. And that was a journey. Yeah. So I know in your, in your story where we talked the other day, there's the forgiveness portion of it, and then there's reconciliation. You know, forgiveness is for yourself, your forgiveness so you can move on, and then to reconcile with someone that has harmed you and hurt you. Yeah, and when I speak about this, um, this is my favorite part to speak about, is the misunderstanding of what forgiveness is all about. We were taught wrong. When, when you were younger and you and your sister got into a fight, right? Mom said, hey, we go never ahead. got in fights. Just watch last week's episode. We never <laughs> fought. <laughs> you go tell your sister you're sorry, right? Yeah. And so somehow or another, you say, I'm sorry, and it's okay. And magically, that exchange made everything right, even the scales of justice, right? Right. That it's an exchange. We're taught that it's an exchange, and it's not exchange. It's one side of a two-sided transaction. It's the part that says, you owe me, there's a debt, and I'm going to write that debt off subject to nothing. Not an apology, not their being alive, not their um, having any judgment or justice done. I mean, what could my dad ever have said or done to even those scales of justice to satisfy my need for that judgment? Nah, there's no nothing. way. Nothing. Or, I, and if you think about it, how silly it is, if I'm waiting, if I'm waiting for that person who hurt me to say, I'm sorry, or to do something different. Let's think about how silly it is. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, mm. to my future, my freedom, my joy, no. to the very person that hurt me. And I refuse to be free and joyful until they basically send yourself to continue to be a victim. Or I can say enough is enough. It's only one side. Reconciliation, whole different ballgame. Reconciliation takes two sides. I want relationships. I'm sorry. I forgive you. And it takes both sides. Very tough to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did it look like to reconcile with your father? How, 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 how did you navigate through that? Yeah, that was a beautiful part. I, I you know, I really became free in a good life of forgiving him. And then I got the phone call, uh, the phone call I never hoped for, but didn't th see coming. And at age 65, he and my mom sobered up, turned their life over to God and the last 23 years of his life, that same monster that should have gone to jail for the rest of his life turned into one of the most wonderful, awesome, godly giving men you will have ever met. If he were here today, you'd be calling BS on my story. There's no way that this guy matches this story. And, and that's correct. And the, the, the story on that, the beautiful thing is you're, you're never too old. You've never done too much bad to find redemption, grace, and forgiveness. In our case, we actually reconciled, did things together, and it had a wonderful, wonderful relationship. So when I think about my dad today, I smile. I think about the good things. Not all the, the childhood trauma that's, that, that was there. That is correct. When it's still, I guess it's there, but it's not defining you, controlling your Doesn't thoughts and your it. mind and your relationships and your ability. And I know when you shared that with me, um, in my mind, I'm just calling it BS. I'm like, there's no, it, a lot of people but, do. oh yeah. And as, and I says, and I may have told them, I was like, okay, guys, look, when he gets done talking today and we get through with the episode, let me know, think if he's full of BS or is like, did he really, does he really, does he really done this? Because there's a sense of peace and joy that you have when you can talk about someone that has caused you so much harm and pain as a child. And it's hard, it's hard for me 
it's hard for me. And maybe it's just me. Someone else watching this may be like, oh, hey, no, his, you know, Kirk, something's wrong with you. Like, I, I align with Mark. But, you know, to me, the way that you have been able to navigate through that and to to find forgiveness for your, you know, for yourself to release him from that, but then to establish and to reconcile a healthy relationship for the last 23 years that your father was alive. It's pretty amazing, man. Um, and the other side of me, as soon as I say that, then I'm like, well, it's BS. Like there's gotta be Absolutely. a part of you that's still pissed off and just wants to punch him in the throat type deal. You know, yeah, look, there, there's so many amazing, amazing forgiveness stories. And I, as I, my coaching, I've seen this, uh, many, many, many times. And, and, um, and, and love to say is, um, well, I can't forgive them. They don't deserve it. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's true, but you do. How's that working out for you? Carrying yeah. around that anger and resentment. So maybe my dad didn't deserve it, but I sure did. And yeah. I'm joining the <laughs> benefits of oh, doing it. Yeah. That. That's correct. Without a doubt. So if someone finds himself in a situation like this, where there's just he heavy emotional baggage, um, what are two or three things that they could do to start or that are needed to start the process of forgiveness? The, the first always is, um, I understand. I get it why you're carrying that around. What happened to you? Every bit. You should be pissed off and angry. Yeah. How's that working out for you? Right. You want to keep that way. Are your shoulders getting tired? So it's saying as I... You know, enough is enough. It's bothering me. I right. want to do something about it. it. That's always, as you know, in a 12-step program, the first step is it's right for, there. Yeah, without a doubt. It still applies. So the other is to step up and say is I'm going to seek advice and help. Look, at 70 times 7, 70x7.org, we've got a lot of different con uh, amazing contact, content in order to help people through that. Um, I've got a book that just came out, Forgiving a Good Man, that details that journey, journey. into a different... Uh, but it's stepping up and saying is, I want to do something about it. Even if you can get into that decisional for point, right? Where we call it decisional forgiveness, where it's just in your head. You don't really feel it as yet. Just that willingness, life will begin to change. But so many people want to hold on to that pain in order to, because it's not right in order to let them go. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you that there's freedom. So when I hold out, the, the objective isn't forgiveness. The carrot holding out is freedom. Yeah. And that first step, like so many other, like 12 step programs is the biggest. Yeah. Just the willingness to do it. Just the willingness to say, I want uh, enough is enough. Yeah. Now I can tell you this. Once you get to the point where you start feeling it, it's not just in your head and have empathy for the fender. My dad was uh, went through a really bad child himself, hurt people, hurt people, where I gave him the gift. It wasn't just for me. And done well, it's because you hear that advice all the time. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for you. Right. It's great. It's a great start. But when you can get where you can give it as an empathy for the person who hurt you, there's all sorts of data on that, that your forgiveness, your joy, your freedom will go up exponentially because we act and we react on mm. how we feel, not how we think. No, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good point. And, you know, it's that the effect of those around you, the effect when we make a change and when we decide that we want something different and are just not willing to settle with, with the way that we were feeling and we want to move through a healthy movement, there's a positive effect that everybody, everybody around feels. is, everybody is going to be there. And it's, and it's there and it's, it's still, it's just going back to that, you know, forgiveness I can get to reconciliation, man, is a hard that's a hard that's a hard like um that's a hard one for me to swallow. I'm just being uh honest. and I see what I see the value in it. I don't have anybody that's harmed me like that that I just truly need to reconcile. But I've got little hurts and just aggravations with people and I'm kinda like, Yeah, I just I'll move on. I'll forgive you, but I don't need you in my life type deal. And I'm thinking, okay. Well, you swallowed a huge object here. I just got, I've got just a little cough drop in my mouth. <laughs> like I just need to go ahead and just swallow it and get on through with this reconciliation with a couple of people. Cause what am I missing out on in life? Like, you know, the same rules apply, whether it's a little thing or a big thing, it's still, it still bothers us. And 
you know, reconciliation requires forgiveness. Forgiveness does not require a, a reconciliation, reconciliation, right? In fact, a lot of cases, it's not healthy or good. You want to stay away. Yeah. Um, or at least give them time, right? So many of your guys that sober up and, hey, mom, dad, I'm sober now. I'm clean. <laughs> Why don't you trust me? Yeah. Well, look, we'll mm. forgive you. We'll write off that debt. However, just like filing bankruptcy, writing off a debt, uh, your FICO score is pretty bad. Yeah. And likewise, I like to call it relational credit score. We're going to slowly, you got a 200, I'll trust you a little bit more over a period of time, and we'll yeah. slowly reconcile together. That's smart. Yeah. But when it's a small or big thing, I like to apply it just you're driving to work and a car cuts you off once, twice, maybe even seven times. And then they go on off and you never see them again. What happens? You show up at work angry, resentful, relationship problems, right? Yeah. And so is with, again, whether it's small or big. So it's not, a, I meet with people whose story is much worse than mine. So it's the same rules apply. If you can learn to forgive subject to nothing, not subject to, they're forg asking anything, subject to nothing, you will find your entire life will be more joyful and free. Uh, that that I can um, agree with. It's easy to agree with. It's hard to always put in practice. Right? Oh, it's not easy. <laughs> that out. So what are, I call them my double Ds. Right? And uh, we've had some fun with them around here on the show. Oh, it was, sure. uh, you know, but it's those daily disciplines. What are two or three daily disciplines you do to keep centered in forgiveness and centered in that mindset to keep living and choosing this way rather than. Yeah. Look, and, and all that I've been through, I've got scars. Um, it's not completely gone. It'll slip back again, those yeah. thoughts. Um, and some days those scars hurt. Um, so I find myself as soon as it starts coming on is to say a prayer, to say a little, uh, a little word to myself that I am worthy, that I'm better than that. I love um, uh, in the morning, and my mirror, my bathroom mirror, I write stuff once a week, uh, that what I'm going to be working on that week. And there's something about just waking up in the morning where you're still semi-conscious that it really gets into the change in my subconscious, my heart, and not just in my head. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of my daily disciplines that I love to do. What's your favorite thing you've been working on? Oh, is the uh, worthiness. Um, is As much as I've been through, when I first uh, number of years lived in Alpharetta, I didn't like it. Only to come realize it's because I didn't feel worthy to. I'm just a street kid from Detroit. And so it, it keeps slipping back. It, it slips back in from time to time. So that's the number one, especially as we're, we're launching this into a nationwide forgiveness movement mm -hmm. with the, yeah. the book. And, the, and uh, as of right now, we're in pre-production to turn it into a feature film yep. that I am, in fact, uh, worthy. It, yeah, It's, uh, you know, to take your pain in childhood and all and all the trauma to put it into purpose of releasing people and freedom and giving them away is is uh is pretty awesome um without a doubt so i, I wish you the best of luck on that and I, I can't wait to see how that goes goes through um before we land a plane is there anything that i haven't asked you because I, I always like to end where you just speak directly to someone that is bound up where you were um, so not speaking to that person, but is there something maybe that we haven't asked or something we haven't talked about that you'd want to share just to make sure that before we close up? Yeah, just that, um, for, for the listeners to this, I, I get it. I get it. Um, you had uh, a rough childhood, mom, dad divorced, um, spouse cheated on you, uh, partner ripped you off. Um, somebody cut you off on the way to work, big, small. I get it. And you have every right to be angry to it. And just wanted to appeal that, um, that there is hope and that it can change all your relationships. And I'm hoping I'm sitting there in front of you uh, yeah. to share that that can happen. But it starts off with um, one out of, uh, taking off that mask, one out of four women have been sexually abused, but one out of six men have. Mm. So how many of the six, 12, 18, 24 men other than Mark yeah. is willing to raise his hand? Yeah. And the thing about shame is if you keep it in the darkness, you have judgment and you have unforgiveness, it stays in there and can eat away at you. But yeah. taking off that mask, and that's where my life changed, which is taking off that mask from not telling anybody about this horrific story, now to share it to as many people as I possibly can, and now even possibly to see it 
acted out title. on a feature film yeah. and theaters all across the United States. Yeah. That's powerful, and I'm free because of it. Without a, without a doubt, without a doubt, we're gonna have all your contact information and everything in the in the description of the video um, on YouTube. And I, I know that you are more than willing to meet with anybody, talk with anybody, and help them. So we're grateful for your willingness to continue to give and serve those that are that are struggling. But if you do me a favor right here before we close up, and if you'll just look right at that camera, and for the for the child that is sitting there with the mask on, full of terror full of fear, pain, and just disbelief. Um, you're living an epic life now. Would you speak some truth in them? Let them know that it is possible and what would be your encouragement for him? Look, I'm not trying to push books, but uh, I, it, we're doing a very short version of this. So in the book, Forgiven a Good Man, get in that detail. But the last turning point was, I get it. In 2014, um, and the church that I'm involved with, we have a thing called small groups. And the first guy up and told his story, and he told everything. And I had two weeks away from telling my story. And it, was I going to tell the normal, like a reporter, has some bad things happen and keep it up? And I was consumed by it. And so I uh, decided to finally take my mask off. I didn't want my wife to hear about it in somebody else's living room. So I told my wife, you better come in the kitchen and sit down. Because there's stuff inside of me I've not told anybody of what happened how I feel about it. And that day I poured everything out and I haven't stopped since. And so um, I get he'd been holding in, holding that inside and bounce between a withdraw to overcompensation, a withdraw to overcompensation. There is hope, there is freedom, and that freedom is found in forgiveness. It's not easy, but it is so worth it. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being here today. Good I to look Thank forward you. to seeing everything that's going to happen for you here in the future. And um, the next time I've got trouble swallowing something, <laughs> I'm going to call you. Uh, uh, or I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get my wife cannot have your contact information because she can't call you and say, hey, you need to you need to call Kirk. He's got to forget, you know. But uh, no, I mean, it's great. Uh, great information. Thank you for being transparent, being open. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for watching this week. <laughs>